and welcome back. We're moving into our final segment for today, and we're talking about a Belize Artifact Conservation Workshop. Uh, it started yesterday, and joining us for this conversation, we have the director of the Museum of Belize, Sherilyn Jones, and we also have a visiting uh, conservator uh, from the Science Museum of Minnesota, Rebecca Newberry. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Now, we don't talk a lot about uh, conservation of artifacts in Belize. So, Shirley, let's just talk about what prompted the need for this kind of a workshop in Belize. Okay. Um, well, this workshop, uh, the need became apparent when we entered into a loan agreement with the Science Museum of Minnesota. They, they are, there's an exhibition that they developed and they borrowed almost 200 pieces uh, from our national collection. A majority of those pieces were in need of conservation or repair for them to be museum worthy for display. And that's when we realized that while we have this vast collection, a lot of it needed some sort of treatment um, and, and it wasn't addressed here. We don't have the skills or the personnel in Belize at this present time. And so while they worked on those pieces that went into the exhibition, th we still had pieces here in Belize that needed to be addressed. And so last year, we partnered with the Science Museum and Ms. Rebecca came down and did some very basic conservation methods and training with uh, museum personnel, uh, archives, the National Library, um, anyone that works with our historical or cultural pieces or objects. Um, and so we did basic uh, object handling, you know, what, what are some of the methods you can do to safeguard that, that th those objects. Um, and so this year is just a follow-up or a, a continuation of what that foundation that was left, uh, that was prepared and everybody that participated. So this year we're dealing with risk management. How is it, what, what is risk management? It's basically identifying whatever hazards that can affect your collection and then putting steps in place to prevent it. Now, it's, it's interesting, Rebecca, because most of the time when we think about artifacts, it's almost like a hands-off kind of approach. Mm -hmm. You know, you think, oh, you don't want to do anything because uh, you may ruin it mm -hmm. more than harm, more than help. Yeah. So what's the, the best way to talk about conservation um, of artifacts? Well, conservation, the field of conservation, um, is a scientific and artistic approach at preserving cultural heritage. So any kind of material, culture, artifacts that anyone's collected, um, and specimens as well, um, need to be preserved if they're held in museums. So what conservation does is we look at what the thing is made of, how, what might affect it, and what might make it fall apart. And then we aim to look for ways to reduce those risks. So it is a good idea to be cautious and, con and not to touch things. And you know, sometimes things are better off left alone, but sometimes if they're left alone in a poor environment, then they need help. So it's, it's getting the knowledge to understand what each artifact needs. We don't do a lot of um, extreme intervention with artifacts without a lot of careful thought. So if something is broken, um, you know, say we break this glass face, um, we know what it Crazy looks like. Glue works. Crazy glue. <laughs> well, there are other adhesives <laughs> that are used in conservation, but yeah, basically you would recover all of the pieces that you could, um, and then you would in investigate what would be the proper adhesive to use. And in, in the conservation field, we look for things that we know will age well, that they're not going to change over time. So we don't want to put it together with an adhesive that may, you know, fall apart in 20 years, and then the repair will be. Um, you will just have to be redone. But we also look for uh, treatments that are retreatable or reversible. So if a better thing comes along, you could undo that treatment purposefully mm. and replace it with something else. So with glass, um, there's an epoxy that's used um, uh, for the most part in conservation. It's very, it's a good clear epoxy called Hextall. <laughs> but, but, um, is it costly? But, yeah, of course. <laughs> conservation in general is costly. Yeah. Um, and while she speaks about, and, and this workshop really gears to the portable objects, you know, we also have to think about conservation on a larger scale. So, for example, our government house, that's a historical landmark. And so how do we put in conservation methods or treatment methods to ensure that the house remains standing for another 100 years? So that's some of the risks mm. that we look at. Yeah. 
Now, it, it's interesting. I remember um, being, uh, you know, exposed to uh, one of the freezes at um, Sunan Antonich. Sunan, yes. And I remember being a, a reporter, actually, um, when they were doing uh, a cast. The, yeah, the fiberglass uh, replica. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's so another cover. conservation. So that's so conservation. Exactly, mm -hmm. that's conservation. What we're doing is protecting the original freeze that's on the, from, from the, the, the elements of nature, rain, sun, soot, whatever. And so we've covered the original with a fiberglass. So people can go and touch that uh, the freeze. Or it's the same thing at Santa Rita. The, the original masks have been covered, and people can go and touch. Like you said, sometimes it's the do not touch. Mm -hmm. um, in those instances, the conservation methods that was employed allows you to then get up close to the monument and, 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 and the mask itself. In objects, no, that's different because artifacts um, are a little bit more fragile, so that's why they're behind glass um, in, in certain cases. Um, and again, it's definitely just to ensure that that face or that pottery remains with us for another 100 years mm -hmm. so that our children and grandchildren will be able to see the vase um, in its completion. Now, yeah. it's interesting that we're talking about this because when we talk about these uh, artifacts that we have, thousands of years old, you're also relying very much on an artistic eye because you, you spoke a little bit about the science and uh, the artistry mm -hmm. behind it because you want to make it seem seamless. Not necessarily. Um, what we want to do, so when we, when we look at how things fall apart, um, we have to respect the original artifact. So um, especially in an archaeological context, we don't necessarily know what something looked like originally. Mm -hmm. um, we can, we can you know, use, the archaeologists can help determine you know, what they think it was and by finding out what things are found together. But um, the point of a conservation treatment isn't to make something look brand new or seamless. It's to stabilize that object and so that it stays safe um, for the next hundred years or beyond, you know, our our mission is to preserve everything for as long as possible. So, so, um, so we don't make often make the decision to make something look perfect, um, unless it was looking perfect beforehand, and we know exactly what it looked like. And and the owner of that piece, the museum or the private owner of that piece, wants it to look that good. Um, otherwise, we don't necessarily. We'll, we'll make it look whole, and we may right. take if there's losses, like if we lost a chunk of it, we might put something in that place that doesn't distract from it but doesn't look brand new either. So Now when I when I said seamless, maybe what I should say is for it to look untouched by modern mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. modern hands. So how do you teach people that art or to develop that eye oh. given the fact that, you know, it's it's almost like a personal kind of, I, I don't know, is it a teachable skill is what yes, I'm asking. It is. Um, and that's not necessarily what I'm teaching in this workshop. Um, it's sort of a, a greater skill. You go to graduate school to, to learn how to treat artifacts. Yes. <laughs> yes, and, to, and you understand all of it. But the way that we approach it is to look at the, ways thing, the way things fall apart. So there's 10 different identified risks to collections. They're called the agents of deterioration. deterioration. Yeah. So we look at those, and then we look at how to, to prevent them. And so when we do face a treatment, we have to think about everything that it will, um, that all the implications of the treatment. It's sort of, it's a long, complicated process, I guess. Um, and, you know, we want to, we also work with uh, the content specialists. So if it's an archaeological piece, we'll definitely work with the archaeologist to know what is this supposed to mean, what is this made of. And so before you start on a treatment, you have to do a lot of research on the piece, especially if you're not familiar with the material. You know, say, you know, how does this ceramic, like things from Belize are generally very humid, for example, because it's very humid here. So you might have um, problems with, you know, even if the ceramic, it could be completely saturated with moisture because, and if you're gonna take it to another country, like to Minnesota, Minnesota, where it gets really dry, you have to think about the damage that you could cause to that piece by drying it out so quickly, you know. So we have, you know, in Belize, the humidity is very high all the time. 
Um, in Minnesota, it varies quite a lot. So, you know, we have to protect things from relative humidity shifts and high relative humidity and low relative humidity. So, so it's things like that you have to, it's, it's a complex decision making. And what I'm trying to do in the workshop is, is help people who work with cultural heritage in Belize understand the ways that things fall apart and then figure out ways that they can reduce those risks. So it's helping people learn how to make the decisions themselves so it's not as dependent on this is what you should do, but hey, here are the challenges we face and what can we do to, to make improvements in it. How much of it is employing um, technology? Because you're talking about testing and to see uh, or trying to mm -hmm. figure out yeah. what uh, was used. Um, um, Especially, for example, I guess in terms of paints mm -hmm. or stains that were used, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, how do you replicate that? You can. That uh, that requires a conservation scientist, which I'm not. I'm a preventive conservator, but but um, there are a lot of analytical tools you can use <laughs> to to determine the chemical makeup of things. Um, you can use grass gas chromatography and um, mass spectrometers that will analyze samples on a molecular basis and tell you exactly what elements make up um, the sample that you have in there so you can figure out what the pigments are made of or what the adhesive is made of. Um, so, but that's, that's beyond my scope, I guess. So I understand it, but I've never done it, so. No, I'm asking all of this because obviously people would think that, um, that it should be kind of straightforward, but it can be very complicated mm -hmm. yeah. from, from this conversation. And uh, we're looking at thousands of pieces mm -hmm. that a country like yeah. Belize mm -hmm. has. And you're talking about limited resources as yes, well. Exactly. So is it where you go on a rotation, um, a, a, a kind of conservation rotation, to see which pieces need it most at this particular juncture, and then you, you go on like a schedule, um, what's the, the best approach? Because obviously you wouldn't be able to, to do everything that no, you exactly. have. No, exactly. Yeah, it's impossible. And every museum, no matter how wealthy they are, faces the same dilemma of how do you prioritize your collection's care. Um, so that's, this is why we use a risk assessment and risk management approach where you look at the 10 agents of deterioration and you look at what's in your collection and how each agent affects your collection and then from there you can set priorities. So in Belize, the majority of the Museum of Belize archaeological collection is stored in an underground basement um, in Belmont Pond that's very, very moist. It's wet. It actually, water condenses on the ceiling and on the walls and it drips on the artifacts. So, so we can look at that and say this is a terrible situation because there's water coming down so how do we make it better? And well the first thing to make it better is to find a new place to keep those artifacts. But that's a long term process because there's a lot of things and it involves quite a bit of work in order to get to a new location. So what can we do in the meantime? Can we look to see where the dripping's the worst and move things away from that? Can we, you know, bring fans in to help, to, with, the to help with the humidity? There's a mold problem because the humidity is so high, so the staff has a trouble working there because the mold makes them sick. So do we make sure that we outfit the staff with appropriate respirators and, you know, disposable clothing so that they don't damage their own clothes and their own health trying to take care of the collection? Um, so it's looking at it from a really large perspective first and, uh, and addressing the larger issues and then you know if you take something out of that wet area and you you know treat it let's say and fix it but you're going to put it right back you've sort of wasted that time and you've exposed that object to risk so it's looking at a larger more holistic way of, of treating things yes. so now uh, and that's a good point that you're you're raising just the storage and I know that has been a challenge for the museum mm, yes. with a, a, yeah. a lot of our national um, pieces but we also know that uh, the, the um, circumstances uh, before excavation may be very uh, rough as well, yeah. you know? Um, and then you want to put them on display mm -hmm. in an air-conditioned kind of uh, environment, environment mm -hmm. or behind glass, etc. So how do you actually prepare a piece to move from excavation, excavation into exhibition? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, you know, like you said, the, 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 the terrain, I don't know, archaeological excavation is, is, is somewhat rough and rigorous compared to a museum pristine setting. Um, 
there's a long process. Uh, first, uh, the designer, the curator decides what pieces go in the exhibition. Um, and then most pieces that are coming from Belize are al almost intact. Mm -hmm. So there's little conservation effort that needs to like put stuff together. Um, where she would come in is to, if something is uh, unstable and we are gonna have it uh, sit on a, in a vitrine for a long time, what do we do to mitigate, mitigate uh, the risk of that tipping over? So that's where the conservation, preventative conservation comes in. And so she would make monks that would hold it in place. For the objects that are on the display right now uh, in the loan, um, a, a couple of the venues uh, were in an uh, earthquake uh, area. So the Science Museum then took all our objects and made them seismic proof, in a sense. So whenever they were placed inside the vitrines or the display cases, they had little clamps or their, you know, their, the base of what they were placed in would sustain an earthquake. So it's, it's taken objects that are, are in a way very stable um, and, and complete and putting them on display and then making, and then that's where she comes in and, and, and finalize and fine tunes how so, we would put it on display. So it's it, this uh, conservation workshop started yesterday. Yes. How long um, is it going to run? And uh, this is phase two. Yes. Part two, yeah. Part two. <laughs> yeah. Part two. And uh, how many um, staff members from the Museum of Belize are participating? I have, we have uh, four staff members from the museum participating. We have uh, personnel from the Belize Archives and Records Service, uh, Leo Bradley Library, Thurton Library, the National Heritage Library, um, and we also have private collectors that are participating. Um, the people from um, Crystal, you know, Crystal has this huge collection um, and it's just in their yard and out on display. So we're teaching them how to better take care of what they have um, so it doesn't fall apart, like what uh, Rebecca is saying. Um, and it goes till Wednesday. They're going to do a site visit um, tomorrow at Shunantanich and Kahopech. Shunantanich just had a, a, a new visitor center that was open, so some of the museum standards are in there. And so we're going to look at Kahopech that hasn't been upgraded um, or revisited since it opened and make comparison based on what they've learned in the last two days. Yeah. So in total, you have, because you, quite a number of partners. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Well, it's important because the knowledge, I mean, we're all working to preserve our history and our culture, and we all work with uh, objects of some nature that speaks to our history. Archives d deals mainly with papers and books, and, and so rather than keep that information to ourselves, we felt that it was important to share it um, and share that knowledge so that everybody's empowered and everybody knows like she says, what are the risks to your collection and how you can prevent it? Um, she talks about the 10 agents of deterioration. One of them is fire. Or do we have a sprinkler system in the museum that if there is a fire, does the staff know what to do? What objects are of high value that they should ensure gets mm. out first? Those are some of the risks that when you do the analysis. Um, another one is pest management. You know, if we have silver fish that's eating our paper or eating or, or books that are 200 years old, it won't last. So what do we do to prevent these kinds of risk? And so that's what we're teaching. Taking the 10 uh, agents of deterioration and offering practical solutions that would work here in Belize. Because like you said, it's expensive. And so there is no point in giving people uh, solutions that are beyond their scope or beyond their financial means but it's simple things that you can do if like she says if the roof leaks in your space where you have collections it's not maybe perhaps a place that you would want to put your display where would you put it to avoid until you can fix the roof I mean the best thing is to fix the roof but if you can't what do you do to change the way you display it so that if it leaks and there's a heavy downfall the rain doesn't affect your piece well, very important work, and uh, Rebecca, uh, of course, this is part two, as you said. Will there be a part three and part four? Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but um, very important um, work, and uh, thank you both for joining me this yeah, morning welcome. and sharing um, some information on this. We wish you the best right. with the conservation workshop. Thank, thank, thank you. you. All right.
We're going to go ahead and take our final break, and when we come back, you'll simply need to wrap. Don't go anywhere. Open your eyes. Conclude after these messages.